up? What is up, my peeps? Joshua Smith here with another GSD mode interview. Every single week, we interview top entrepreneurs and just straight up top badasses out there dominating their spaces. They're people choosing to not live a life of mediocrity, but instead to go out there and create big, epic lives for themselves and for their families. So today, guys, we got a special guest on the show. This is a guy that's a good personal friend of mine. I've known for a lot of years, um, and I've seen him do some pretty amazing transformations. You know, he's a guy that um, got to a point in his life and, and realized, man. I, I, I may, maybe am going down this mediocre path or a path I don't like um, and decided to make a big shift and uh, go out there. And now he's just kicking ass and have a massive success in the real estate space. So really stoked and honored to have my good friend, Jeremy Smith, on the show. Welcome to the show, my friend. Hey, thanks, Josh. Good morning, brother. How are you? I'm oh, doing awesome, dude. Uh, stoked to have you on the show, bro. I mean, we I, you know, we saw you a few months ago. And at that point, you know, you're... you're um, because you're you're a new real estate or not a newer real estate agent, if you will, and Correct. and um, you made that transition while you still had your you know your your job or your corporate job, whatever you want to call it, there, and right. and you were able to finally you know kind of cut ties with that and make that transition and hitting the ground running, man. So you know I'm really excited to um, you know share your journey with our audience, dude, because. Um, you know, a lot of realtors are in that same position. I would say most, right? Um, right? Which is really the fiscally responsible, smart way to do it. You know, right? You got to provide for your family, and then you're jumping into the unknown where it's months without a paycheck. And and like I said, man, you're you're a guy that that did it uh, pretty quickly um, and did it with big success. So really excited to jump into that. But before we do that, dude, um, let's rewind the clocks, man. Like like what what made you decide to jump into real estate entrepreneurship in the first place? Well, man, it's kind of a kind of a funny story, man. I got out of the military back in 2000, and um, I was coaching my son's t-ball team, and, and I wanted to be a LA County Sheriff's deputy, right? So I met one of the dads, and that's what he did. And he was like, "Hey, man, uh, you might want to look into real estate, right? Check this out. I do both, you know, and I and I make a killing." I was like, "Okay, well, sounds doable." So I I looked into it, and um, in 2003 I got my license, and that was in Southern California. And just got in almost a similar situation to what I was in recently where I left a full-time job after a year and um, started just doing real estate, completely different approach from what I have now, but uh, started in 2004 out there, you know, and uh, I loved it, man. It was, it was, I, I could tell that it was somewhere that I wanted to be. It was a place where I, I just fit in. So then, okay, so so because um, you're in California, or that was when you're in California, you made that transition. Right. I know now you're in Texas. So like, what what right, right. what happened there? I mean, you, you started doing, su- yeah. you know, having success. I mean, what what then led you then to Texas? Right. So so I was having success, but you know, I grew up real poor, and I had some money now, and financially very irresponsible. You know, so I uh, didn't run the the business like a business, ran it like a job, and. Uh, had a minimal amount of savings. I said six months of a saving saved up, you know, and um, we we're doing great. And the bottom fell out of the market in 06 in my market in Southern California. And um, I didn't know how to adapt. You know, I didn't know where to look. I didn't know what to do. All I knew is that I had a family that was dependent on me to uh, to provide a shelter and food on the table, you know. So I um, thank God I got a job uh, with a local railroad because I wasn't able to adapt adapt with real estate and a major class one railroad hired me in 2007 I went from making you know six figures in real estate to making about forty four thousand dollars a year in uh, in 2007 and that was with the railroad for almost 10 years up until the time when I just recently left. But back in 2012, I had an opportunity to relocate from California uh, to Texas. And we jumped on the opportunity because my dream was always to get back into the business, do it differently, do it right a second time because I know it's what I love to do. And um, did some research and saw that the market in this location really didn't crumble as it did where I was before. I mean, everywhere took their hits, you know, with the recession, but um, this one was a little bit more stable. So we made the move uh, here to Texas in 2012, and the goal was always to get licensed here and, uh, and, and just do things differently. So there was a period of about eight years where I maintained my license in California, but just didn't practice. Yeah. So then once you got to Texas, man, um, 
you know, I mean, with the goal of always jumping back into real estate, at what point did you realize, okay, man, I'm ready to start attacking this again? You know, I know that you were still working the job, but you were you were doing both. Right. But at what point did you decide, let me get my license in Texas and really start getting intentional about making this move happen? Well, that was in uh, early 2015. I had, uh, shortly after I moved here, I, I promoted to manager position and uh, was working 12-hour days. And I just saw that there was no end in that game for me, right? There was a limit on to how much I could financially make per year um, because I was not willing to sacrifice more time, right? So with that corporate job, you can you can get more money, you know, the sky's the limit there, but you sacrifice and that sacrifice is not a sacrifice I was willing to make. So, uh, you know, we discussed it as a family and said, hey, let's, let's get into this, but we're going to take it slow this time. I'm going to train, I'm going to um, save up a year and a half worth of my annual salary at the railroad and uh, once I get that then I'll leave more experience database built up do it right because I don't want to do this ever again you know this way so this is it so um, so yeah so in 2015 is when I got my license last year I believe it was in March and uh, just set a five-year goal you know the thing was okay well in five years you know I should have enough saved up to where I can I can bounce out of here comfortably and then uh, I was trolling the, the Facebook one day and saw your ad for mega open house jumped on that and you know a year and a half later you know I've left the railroad so that uh, that five-year goal was cut 20 percent you know <laughs> in the 20 yeah. percent what I normally said it at that's epic, man. I love it. So so let's go deep into that, dude, because I know, I mean, pretty quickly you got to a position, not only did you have the money in the bank, but you got to a point where your real estate income surpassed your railroad job income. Um, and I mean, you still kept doing them both because you learned your lesson last time and then you're responsible right. with it. So, um, you know, but, but most people can't fathom it, right? Because they're like, oh man, I got this job. Because it the railroad also wasn't a f typical eight hour work day for you right, either. Right. So you're working a ton there, you're having to work real estate, and you also got kids, and you're also fit and take care of your health, and you're married. Right. And so walk us through like how you got started, kind of how you'd schedule your day, and how you started, uh, uh, what you did differently now compared to before to go out there and create the success. So that, that's a tough one, man, because yeah, it was 12 hour days, you know, on, on the railroad, but my schedule was was kind of unique where I would work three days on and that I have four days off and then I work four days on and I have three days off. Right. So that was very conducive to, uh, to building this business because on my four days off, there's a lot that I could do, um, for real estate. And then being in a management position, I had flexibility, you know, so I could, I could step out and I could make phone calls, you know, or I could answer emails. So, it was kind of a unique situation. So what I really did was I started focusing on getting listings because those are what required the least amount of my time. Um, so once I went through your boot camp and got your uh, the listing presentation that you provide, I just kind of mastered that. That was like the first thing that I wanted to master because I knew that that was going to be the best use of my time and provide the uh, the greatest ROI. So I mastered that. Uh, went on a my first listing appointment on a for sale by owner. And um, it was actually, I did an open house for her and kind of an impromptu listing appointment during the open house. And uh, that, that actually ended up being my first listing. But my, you know, that was my approach to just try and get listings. Yep. Yep. Love it, dude. So, so again, though, okay. So, so you're out there. It sounds like then you're, you're setting up your, your, open houses with for sale by owners, developing that relationship, getting those listings. Um, so just kind of kind of continues to walk us through the journey. So you got 18 months. Um, so you're getting some listings. You're doing business there. Um, but still, you know, I know on a couple of those days off, but now you got paperwork coming in. You got other clients that you're working with. You know, right. as you start, you know, it's okay maybe when you have one client, but you get to the point where you have 10 clients plus your other job. Kind of walk us through maybe like what daily schedule was like on that from, um, you know, paperwork to prospecting to clients. I'm like, how you balance it? Man. So I, I honestly, I wasn't very organized, <laughs> but, uh, so on my days off, um, I'm up at 4 AM, I'm hitting the 445 class, uh, for, to work out. Once that's done, you know, I'm, I'm prospecting by eight and, um, try to spend at least an hour to hour and a half prospecting on the phones. Um, 
And then I'm just really doing the four posts a day for Facebook. I'm hitting people up on messages that I hadn't talked to previously. And, uh, and kind of going from there and trying to stick to the 90s, 60s as, as closely as I really could. Yeah. Um, and then I was, you know, really pressed in those days off to get as much as I possibly could done because I knew on the days when I was not off, it wasn't going to be much. So I would spend, you know, I would go into work at, at 5 a.m., wouldn't get off until 5 p.m. And then I'd come home, you know, and, and just grind, you know, until about 9 10 o'clock at night and then go to bed and repeat the next day. So it's definitely a grind, you know, it was a lot of hours, a lot of sacrifice on the family. And that was one of the things, you know, going into it that we had talked about was it is the year of sacrifice because I don't want the, I don't want it to be a five year goal. I mean, that's what I allowed myself, but I didn't really want that. Um, and, and nobody else wanted that either. You know, the family wanted me to be able to go on, vacation when we want to go on vacation or not work the holiday because the railroad is 24 7 you know you work thanksgiving you work christmas so um they wanted me home and they're very supportive i had the support of my wife which is um a key part of that probably in april i believe it was she came on because the workload just got too much right we were too many deals going on and uh she started doing my transaction coordinating and uh admin so you know there's a learning curve you know because i had to train her and i had to take time to do that and she picked up really quick and uh, now she's pretty much taken over that position and, and i really don't touch the files anymore once we execute a contract it goes to her and, and i only hear about it if we need to deal with an issue but uh yeah i mean the 90s 60s was, was very important to to stay on those because if I hadn't, you know, that, that was just a good baseline for me to start with. Yeah, man, they're, they're so huge. And those of you that are watching and listening that maybe don't know what a 9060 is, it's a, uh, it's a productivity exercise that we teach inside the boot camp. But it just, you know, the average person pisses away 30 plus percent of their day and just interruptions and allows you just to get way more done with less and be uber productive. So that's huge. You give us an idea, give our listeners an idea of, um, you know, because again, a lot of people are in the same position. They got this job, this corporate job, you know, they, they have their family to support. They want to jump into real estate, but they got these limiting beliefs that it may not be possible. What kind of income were you making in your real estate business or, or you know, sales volume were you doing before you decided to give your resignation like in the last 12 months, let's say? Uh, you know, I talked to you and you mentioned, hey, you know, be consistent with your closings, right? Make sure you're closing X amount of deals every month for a period of time before you before you bail. And uh, and we were up to averaging four four closings a month for probably about five months. Um, July we had seven, so we had pretty good volume, you know. And um, so the momentum was good, you know, until the time where I left. It was like, okay, we're we're consistent, right? The business is coming in. We're getting referrals now because now I've been in the business for a year. Um, I don't know why that was a magic number, but it just seemed like it took a year for people to say, okay, they're, they're real, you know, and, um, start referring us clients. So we had a pretty, pretty good, I would say, you know, average, uh, well, the average commission is probably around five grand or something like that in closing four a month. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, you start banking twenty grand a month, your life uh, uh, changes pretty quickly, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, for yeah, anybody, it, it, man, it gets a lot. Of, it gets a lot easier as far as stress and and bills and stuff like that. You know, as we were able to catch up, we were able. I mean, we're we are almost completely debt free aside from the house. So yeah, it's been a it's been a good year. That's awesome, bro. So um, you know, what really also impresses me about all of this is. Not only were you able to build the, this big, I mean, you, you did more than most are able to do that don't have a job or even a family. Dude. Like, I meet all these like young 20 year old cats that jump in this business, even that join my team. And, you know, do they struggle to make 30, 40 grand a year? And I'm like, dude, you got all the time in the world. Right. Um, you know, it's just, just lack of commitment, you know, right? Um, but the, the other thing too is, you know, you're a dude that takes care of your health, man. Every single day, right. like you're uber committed to these. And I know it gets difficult, right? I mean, none of it's necessarily hard to do, which is very difficult because we, 
you know, it's it's hard to stay disciplined mentally. And um, how did you go like keep it all together during that time? Because I'm sure there's times where you were wanting to throw in the towel. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, when, when you were going through those tough times trying to keep all this together, you know, h- how did you keep staying strong and, and keep pushing forward? You know, at the end of uh, my listing presentation, I talked about my why, right, and why 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 me and, and why what drives me. You know, so. Um, I always kept that at the forefront, you know, when things got difficult because they, they really did. I mean, when I was working at a full time job and closed seven deals in July, man, I was on decision fatigue like I had never felt in my life, you know, and and my responsibility at the railroad was to make decisions 12 hours a day, you know, and um, so it was it was pretty it got pretty bad. <laughs> it got pretty, pretty gnarly there. But um, just keep an eye on 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 my why. You know, my uh, my dream was was bigger than any of the uh, hardships that I was going through at that time. You know, and I knew it, I had faith in myself, you know, that if I were to uh, just make it through, you know, and keep pushing hard, keep pushing hard, that uh, I could get to where I wanted to be. In, and I could put all that behind me, look back and, and know that I grew from it. Yeah, love it, dude. So then you talk about um, something you said earlier was about getting, um, you know, you and your wife clear congruent on the same page it seems like an entrepreneurship you know so much of the lack of success that that i see people have or or maybe they have to drop out entrepreneurship isn't because of the work that's involved um it's you know it's it's all the other life pressures dude their 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 spouse isn't on the same page and all these different life pressures and a lot of times it's man they didn't they didn't get clear they didn't communicate they didn't you know so somebody that 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 is maybe wanting to make the plunge like you did you know, what, what conversation would you recommend that they have with their significant other? What should that look like? You know, how, how were you able to create such a big success? Because it's harder on them than it is on us, you know, right? Right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I was blessed, man. My wife has always supported me in the things I wanted to do. I've, I've taken some crazy ventures and, and she's always rode along with me. So, uh, um, I guess, the what I would just recommend is that, that they have a real, you know, heart to heart. Like, hey, look, these are my dreams. You know, if it's your dream, you know, to be that entrepreneur and, and to create your own life and your own future, just be completely honest with your spouse and talk to them about that and lay it out. Go into it with a plan. I know, I mean, everybody's different, but some people like numbers. You know, I say, hey, look, here's the numbers. Here's what I want to do. Um, I need your support, you know, and, and go into it with giving and then ask, you know, for in return for that support. And, like I said, it's definitely critical, in my opinion, that that support be there. Because if you're not both on the same page, I mean, they're going to get tired of, of the grind. Because it is a grind, for sure. Until you can get to a point where you don't have to grind anymore, you got to grind. Yep. Yep. Love it, dude. So, the, and that's actually a perfect transition. My next question, dude, is, you know, I've seen a lot of, uh, a lot of realtors that um, – leave their job, jump into real estate full-time once they've started creating the, the necessary income in real estate to make it sense to do so. But then now that the other job's not there, you know, they start kicking up their feet. They don't put in the same intention of focus because before they had to, now necessarily they don't have to. So now that you've made this transition, um, you know, how, what are you doing to keep that focus, um, you know, and, and stay the, keep that same discipline and that same intensity? Well, the first thing I did is I doubled my goal, right? So, you know, through this year, my goals have changed several times. My goal is funny because I've got my first goals written on my wall, right, or on a piece of paper stuck on the wall right above my desk. And uh, it was like, I want to net 75K this first year, right? And, and, and so when I was getting close to reaching that goal, I adjusted that goal and I went up. And then I listened to Grant Cardone and he told me to 10X that goal. You know, I didn't get quite that crazy, but I almost I did almost double it, you know, so um, stay focused on the goals, you know, and, and keep pressing yourself to do more and, and to reach harder for those neck that next level. Um, something that's helped me out, too, is that our brokerage puts out these, you know, every month, the top 10, you know, yeah. and um it was, it, I always want to be number one. I'm so competitive. You know, I want to, I want to be that guy. 
So I was striving for that even with two jobs. And I consistently am on that top 10 list. And in July, I got number one. So I'm like, I told my broker, so when I get number one, just don't even think about changing that because I'm going to stay there. And in fact, I'm going to build my team next year and, and you're going to be number two. So that's just, for me, it's just being competitive. You know, I, I, I want to create the opportunities for the family. I want to pay off my son's college debt. You know, I want to, there's just so much I want to do and um, so much that needs to be done that I, I can't take my foot off the gas pedal at all. One, I don't want to, and two, uh, I'd be bored. Yep, yep, love it, dude. So, um, Artie, so like, what, what are you doing, you know, kind of walk us through, you know, some of the strategies that you're doing right now to create this kind of success. Because it's, you know, we're, we're getting ready to, is, we're creating this interview, dude, what, did, what's December 1st, 2016, so we're getting ready to enter 2017. The game, right. you know, the fun, there's always fundamentals that, that apply, but also the games change with, with systems and technology. And, you know, what are some of the things that you're doing right now that are really working well that allowed you to get to seven closings, dude, in like 12 months of, of selling real estate part-time? Right. So one of the major things that's, uh, that worked for me this year was Facebook. I mean, it was huge for me. I, I would think of the numbers about 60% of my business this year, it came from Facebook. And whether that's directly from posting in groups or that's friends seeing me posting all the time, um, whatever, you know, that, that's been my main real advertisement. It's just a Facebook group post and, and uh, posting four times a day on Facebook. Um, that's been huge. Some other things that I've done, and because my work schedule, I wasn't really able to um, do a ton of open houses. So I did close a couple of deals from open houses this year. So that was definitely uh, time well spent. The other one was door knocking. Yeah. So whenever I took a listing, you know, I would go door knock that area, and especially in my farm area, because I want them in my database. So um, that actually was a was a great. Uh, source of, of leads and, and closings for me this year. So I say Facebook was number one, door knocking is number two. And, um, yeah, and expires actually doing expired mailers. That was a good one for me this year too. So we kind of dabbled in everything, um, just to kind of feel more, one, what we were comfortable with do what was working for us and what we need to focus on more. So going into 2017, you know, it's, we're going to continue with Facebook. That's definitely not going away. I don't think anytime soon, um, and then door knocking will be number one or number two. And then we're going to really, really hit on open houses. We've got some pretty good ideas for, for some open house strategies this year. Yeah. Now with the expired, the expired mailers, I mean, what, what do you, are you, are you calling or are you just straight up hitting them up with a, with a mail or letter? Well, before we were doing the letters, just the letters and we were putting them on kind of a, a campaign. So we would send a letter out and then a certain amount of time later we send, send them out, uh, my wife does all that now. Her and my daughter are um, in charge of that. So, um, but what we've added to that are phone calls. So that's part of my Monday, my morning calls because I'm calling expireds. Um, we're putting them on drip campaigns through Perfect Storm, um, reaching out to them that way. So we're we're kind of trying to hit them from three different angles. Yeah, love it, dude. Yeah, I, and in your door knocking, man. Um, you know, the, the video that you did that you posted in the group oh, yeah. was pretty awesome. Yeah, you kind of like had your phone hidden in your pocket so you kind of see what was going on. Um, you know, the cool thing about your your approach, and I don't know if that's the approach that you always use, but that you use there, like, dude, I mean, you're not getting people to tell you to get the hell off their doorstep. It's just a very down-to-earth, hey, what's happened? You know, kind of, kind of walk us through what that script looks like and what that is because so many people – have such a massive fear, like somebody's gonna pull out a gun on them, or, or you know, <laughs> take a swing at them. Yeah, yeah, and you never know, man. You could be really nice, and that still may happen, I guess. But <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but I guess always be aware of your surroundings. But um, so my approach with the door knocking was whenever I would take a listing, I uh, or if I'm gonna have an open house, you know, I'll, I'll go door knock and. And so they answer the door and I, I introduce myself. Hey, good afternoon, sir, ma'am. My name is Jeremy. I'm a local realtor here with Remax. Just recently listed your neighbor's house at 1234 Main Street. Um, I just want to let you know, um, part of our campaign is we do massive marketing for our listings. And we expect there to be a huge turnout of buyers in this area. So I just want to give you a heads up. The property is going on the market on Wednesday. In case you see a bunch of cars around the neighborhood, people making U-turns that you've never seen their cars before, I don't want you to be alarmed. It's probably because they're coming to check out the house. Um, definitely stay vigilant. 
you have any questions, here's my card. Feel free to give me a call. Oh, and by the way, um, a lot of your neighbors are on my monthly market update email list. I would love to get you on that list. What's a good email address for you? Yeah, that's awesome, dude. And I changed that, man. So before I was like, this last time that day that I recorded that one, um, before that I was like, hey, uh, can I get your email address? You know? yeah. <laughs> and then Ezra was like, no, boom, slam door. But uh, when I just kind of went through the assumptive close, hey, I'd love to get you on there. What's a good email address for you? And then the, they just come. Yeah, it's killer, man. It's it's leading from contribution, man. It gets you so yeah. much further in today's world, and it's it's you know you're 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 developing instant connection because they, they can tell that you're or f- at least get the feeling that you're looking out for them with with prepping them about the neighbor's house and right. You know, I love right, it. and I really am because I'm a father, you know, and I've got young kids, and every time I see a car coming by, that I don't realize, man, my eyes are out. Right? I'm like, okay, well, what's this guy doing? What's this guy doing? And if I know, you know that, and that's kind of where. I, where I started, got that idea from. I said, well, if I know some, you know, something's going on down the street, I'm still going to be paying attention, but my, you know, spidey sense is not going to be so high. Yeah. So, so when you were in California, dude, you mentioned that, um, you know, part of the reason that uh, you, 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 your business didn't make it out there is because you treat it as a job, not a business. Now you're intentional about treating it as a business. You know yeah. your numbers and your planning. Kind of walk us through, like, give us an idea of like what the difference is. Like, what did you used to do that you feel you would try, treat it like a job, like a lot of realtors didn't have the success compared to what, how you treat it today. Oh man. Uh, so I door knocked back then too. I've always been comfortable with that. And that was probably my main source of leads. Um, and I did one specific area that was my farm area and I did a lot of mailers out to them. Um, but what I did not do is one of probably horrible at follow up. I didn't lead generate enough. Um, when I first got my license, I got on a team and um, the team leader said, hey, here's a phone, here's a phone book, you know, set some appointments. I had no script. You know, I had to start just from my own thoughts, you know, and kind of dream this thing up. And and I did set appointments, you know, so I knew I could do that without any training. You know, I was able to do it. But once I left that team and went on my own, I didn't call anybody, you know. So um, lead generation was lacking, didn't know the numbers, and also – I got comfortable, comfortable, got complacent, you know, some days slept in till 10, you know, and, and just treat it like a job. You know, it was one of those things where I can get up and do what I want when I want and the money's going to continue to come, you know, until it didn't, you know, I was like, Oh, wait a minute. That didn't work. So I definitely love the job or the career. I love this business, but this time I just, I'm doing it different. I'm tracking my numbers. I'm staying in the game every day um hustle is not gonna stop i don't care how much i make it's still gonna come because i know one day i may slow down yep yeah, it's funny you know i i i hear this all the time from realtors where they're like oh man i just feel like the grind never stops and i always feel like you know i'm the, I'm the rat inside the wheel and mm-hmm. i'm like look dude like one of my good friends is a top neurosurgeon on the planet right very successful neurosurgeon well guess what he has to do surgeries every damn day. The second he yeah. stops doing the surgery, the second he stops getting paid, you know, like these, these realtors a lot of times have this like perception that they, they can stop the hustle. And I don't know, it's not just real estate. I don't know any business where, where the hustle stops, you know, right? No, so No, it, it doesn't, man. And if uh, it's funny because I'm listening to uh, Grant Cardone's book, Be Obsessed or Be Average, right now. And this morning when I was on my way back from the gym, that's what he was talking about. You know, a time when... When he was, you know, being successful, and he stopped, and he he said rested on his laurels, you know, and uh, and and, and it was a negative thing for him, you know. So, I, I think that you know you can't do that. You gotta you gotta keep grinding. If you don't like to grind, find a grind that you do like, you know, and and, and keep going for it. Yeah, what's cool about you, you know, watching your career, dude, is it's not like you're doing. You know, like you said earlier, you're not doing much different than you did in California. It's a lot of the tactics are still the same. I mean, the Facebook stuff's new, but, you know, there, there's those timeless fundamentals. It's just your approach to it, you know, right? You're treating right. the business, you're tracking those numbers, you're being consistent. So kind of kind of give us an idea of what that is. What does consistency mean, you know? Because um, people get so discouraged so fast. Like, oh, dude, I've been generating these Facebook leads for 30 days and I don't have a client yet, so it doesn't work. You know what I mean? They, and consistency, right. as you and I know, or is the only magic pill that exists. Yeah, absolutely. So I remember something that you said to us was, um, 
was attach the process and detach to the out from the outcome, you know, and, and that resonated with me because there are times like that, you know, there's times where, like you say, you're going to go 30 days and, and you can't get a, a, a good phone number for a lead that you got off Facebook. They're all wrong or they're all somebody else and they're pissed off at you for calling them. And well, that's going to happen, you know, but it only takes one to make up for all of that stuff. Right. So, with the struggle comes the success and with the success comes the fulfillment, you know? So I would say just keep grinding at it, you know, keep grinding it and don't get discouraged. Be, have faith that it's going to come through because when it does, I mean, the feeling is great. And, um, yeah, just, just stick with it. What, uh, what internally drives you, dude? Because, you know, it's, um, we find that, that good enough or good becomes the worst enemy of greatness. And so many people do just get so, you know, things are good enough. I mean, now, dude, you're banking good cash. You could probably just hire a, a, another assistant and, and start backing off a little bit. Like, what keeps you personally not settling for that and going after greatness? Uh, because my goals won't let that happen, man. I got to, uh, I got, I got big goals. So I know if I, if I do that, then I'm not going to reach those goals. And, um, and because I don't, you know, work for an employer anymore. I am my own employer. I can set my own goals. I have ownership in them and I have a vested interest in making sure that I reach them. So that's pretty much it, man. I just, I've got goals and I I can't take my foot off the gas pedal, off the gas pedal or disengage, you know, or, or I won't get there. Yeah. So, um, how do you, how do you go from, you know, um, because, okay, dude, and I don't know the exact amount of money that you were making at the railroad. You know, you talked about when you, you went from making six figures in California to 40 grand, mm-hmm. you know, and, and, and so a lot of, I, you know, I find a lot of entrepreneurs, they go from making 50, 60 grand, now they're making, you know, a couple hundred grand a year, and they have a very difficult time with their, their inner circle, if you will, because all the people that they've spent, you know, you're an average of five people you spend most time with. So all before, right. you know, now they're making three, four times the money. All of the people around them are still, you know, the people that are still in the, the corporate job making the 50, 60 grand a year. And you see a lot of internal struggles going on with trying to level up and getting your friends to buy in and support your goals. And then you get, you know, people around you. It's it's the crabs in the bucket, right? They're always trying to pull right. you back in. You know, right. uh, um, ha, has, have you experienced that? Um, you know, has it been a challenge? And if so, what have you done to overcome that? No, um, not necessarily. Um all my closest friends that I grew up with, you know, from high school and up, um, they would still live in California. So don't really hang out with too many people out here that's not associated with work or, or working out, you know. So um, it was a six-figure salary at the railroad, so it's not too much different than what I was. I mean, it's bigger six figures now, but it's still, you know, that same realm. Um, and then through CrossFit, I mean, our gym, there's a lot of business owners there. there's a lot of successful people there um so i'm kind of in the same realm for now so i really haven't experienced experienced that yet but we don't really hang out much anyways so you ain't got time man to be nope. making that cheese baby <laughs> so no, no hanging out <laughs> So you talk about talk about your self development. Talk about reading books and and uh, you know you talk about Grant Cardone, who you and I are both big fans of. Um, how important is is self development to you to your success? And what is how intentional are you with it on let's say a daily, weekly basis? Oh man, it is imperative. And I it's funny because I get on my soapbox whenever I'm talking to anybody who's my friend that want to do something different. And I'm like, read the book, listen to this book. You know, they probably get sick of that, but it made a huge difference in in my mind. Um, and I'm, I'm every day. I mean, every day I've got some sort of audio book going in. Um, I leave for the gym about 4.30 and I listen to the book all the way to the gym, which is about 10 minute drive. And then I listen to it on the way back. And anytime I'm in my car, it's playing. If I'm not having a phone conversation or I have people in my car, you know, I'm listening to those books. And um, I always try to make sure that the book is relative to what I need, right? Because I have gone out and got some books where I was like, okay, well, this is boring. Like, yeah. not that I know this already, but this is not really what I'm interested in right now. You know, they're good books. It just wasn't resonating with me at that time. So I made sure that when I was getting books, it was books that is really relates to where I'm at in my life and where I need to be in my business. Um, and it's, it's been huge. I mean, it's been really big. Yep, love that, dude. Um so when it comes to um, 
uh, um, you know, back going circling back to the self development because I, I like that you brought that up, dude. Of because we see so many people that just read books to read books. We see so many people that hire coaches to hire a coach because they, they know they need to be reading. They know they need to be getting, uh, you know, that next level of training, but they don't know how to identify what you really need. Like, what do you do to make sure that you are reading the right book? I mean, how do you know what you need? Well, it's kind of trial and error, um, but I just kind of assess where I'm at, right? So there was a point in time where, right, probably months before I left the railroad where I had a lot of self-doubt. You know, I was like, well, well, shoot, I failed at this once. You know, am I going to fail again? Am I going to let my family down? Where are we going to be if I fail? You know, and all those questions are running through my head. So um, for me, the best person to listen to in that situation was Grant Cardone. And I listened to it because of his story, you know, where he was, where he started, um, where he's at now. And I just really relate to the way he delivers the message. You know, so I was listening to him at that point. And then when I finally said, OK, you know, I'm going to have faith in myself. I can do this. I think I've proven it to myself. I just got to realize that. And then um, it was starting to be like, OK, well, now I need to change that focus to how do I run a business? So we went out and uh, got the E-Myth, yeah. uh, E-Myth Revisited, you know, and so we hit that one hard. That's probably one of my favorites, yeah. right, because that one just like – and then my wife listened to it too, and it just set us on fire. You know, we're like, okay, well, this is where we need to be. This is what we need to do. This is what we're doing right. This is what we're doing wrong. So really just uh, assessing where we're at mentally and where we're going and, and kind of try to pick a book that, that fits that. And a lot of people are recommending them like on the – on your the GSD Mo page and the alumni group, uh, a lot of great recommendations from them. Yeah, no, I, I love it, dude. Yeah, man, that E Myth Revisited, dude. I think I've read that thing about a dozen times. You know, different parts yeah. of my business and life, and it's it's a quick read, but holy shit, is it so eye opening, mm. dude? It's, it's, it's powerful, man. It is definitely powerful. I actually turned one of my buddies on to it. He was uh, he owns a carpet cleaning business, and and he's in that technician phase, you know, where he's he's drowning, you know. And I'm like, dude. Listen to this book, please, because it's going to help you so much. He's great. I mean, he's great at what he does. He's got great reviews. And, man, the dude's just going to own this area, but he just needs to get past that. You know, and I wouldn't have been able to help him with that had I not read that book. So it was, it was awesome. So give us an idea of, you know, because a, a lot of people think it, it, it makes it takes all this money to make all this money in real estate, right? So, you know, now right. today you might be spending a little bit more because you're doing some more mailers for the expireds and stuff. But when you first got right. started and first started getting to that point where you're closing those four deals a month, you know, what, what type of, of costs did it take monthly to operate your real estate business? Well, in the beginning, uh, when I first started, so I did the licensing and all that cost, you know, and the schooling and all that. And then when I found your program, I always tell people this. I had two choices at that time, right? Because our, our broker is doing Buffini. And it was like, I think less than 400 bucks or somewhere close to there for the Buffini. I had $2,000 in the bank in my savings. And I was like, okay, well, which one do I do? You know, the Buffini is going to save me a bunch of money. I got a listing with doing Joshua's thing. So, I made a leap of faith, man, and I, and I chose you. Well, that was half my savings, right? And I didn't do a payment plan. I just paid it, um, and so half my savings was gone. Um, best investment I could have ever made. But now, um, going from there, I would say probably every listing was costing me because I didn't have lock boxes, and I refused to use combo boxes, so I had to go buy you know, the super box. Um, I was doing professional photography. Listings were costing me about 500 bucks up front. Per listings, but I've I've been able to kind of curtail some of that cost. I was just up front, so I say probably up front, um, eesh, maybe five hundred to a thousand dollars a month if I had got two listings. Yeah, and and part of that was just for the cost of a sign, cost of you know the lock box, and once those were bought, I don't got to spend it again. But it, it just until I got that stuff. Yeah, which is a smart investment at that point because I mean as long as you yeah. don't. You don't price the listing horribly you know you're, you're right. you got a good chance it's going to sell and, and Absolutely. you're going to get that roi back as far as like a marketing cost you know um you know because i heard a coach um i was watching this video not too long ago and this one coach is in there like do if you want to dominate your area you know you buy buy all that you can in zillow and you know do this and i, I started calculating everything that he was saying in his head and i'm like that's like 10 g's a month 
for what you're telling agents to go out there and do. Um, and I think agents feel this massive pressure. They got to spend all this money in marketing to get started. Um, and, um, you know, I mean, it, it's just something that yeah. I, t- I totally disagree with. But um, I do too. Yeah. I do too. I, I think I was probably about, for marketing, probably about $200 a month. Yeah. Is probably what I was doing. And that was probably just a cost of material. So what I started to do, the very first thing I did was I had a local printer print up some market um, value or market report postcards for my farm and I hand delivered them. You know, I didn't mail them. I went door knocking and I hand delivered them. Um, and that was the first thing I did. So I would say probably about 200 bucks a month in the beginning. Facebook group posts are free. So I didn't you know, spend anything there. I didn't have a website at the time. Um, but I was just focused on branding and getting my name out there and, and being in front of the eyes. So most of the stuff I was doing was completely free. And actually, our brokerage, we could borrow open house signs too at that time. So I didn't even have one open house sign. Yeah. That's how I started, man. I, I'd go beg agents in my office to do open house or open houses at the properties, and then when they said yeah, I'd be like, well, and then can I also borrow your signs? Right. <laughs> but I'd wait till they, I'd wait till they committed to saying yes to the open house, and exactly. you know, I mean, I, I was broke as a joke, man. So um, love it, dude. So if you could go back now today, uh, or if you knowing what you know now and the success that you have now, if you could rewind the clocks and go back to the Jeremy getting your license brand new in California and give yourself, you know, like two main pieces of advice knowing what you know now today what would that be oh man god there's so much top two all right so i would tell myself to be consistent and be disciplined that's the first thing i would tell myself um second thing i would say was to keep your eye on what's going on around you right keep keep your keep your thumb on the pulse of the market and and look at because when the market crashed in, in 2006 in, my, in our market, I had no clue. It was like I was clueless as to what was going on. So all of a sudden, I had five listings, and none of them were selling. It just stopped, you know. So I continued marketing these things and did not look into REOs. Just continued to do the the normal thing, you know, that I had been doing, and and it just I didn't adapt. So one, be be able to adapt, and, and two. Um, be disciplined. Yep. Love it, dude. Love it, man. So, you know, I started this podcast, dude, because I wanted to go out there. I, I got, I mean, there's a lot of great information out there, but there's a lot of bad information too, a lot of smoke and mirrors, and it's very difficult for all entrepreneurs, um, you know, whether in the real estate industry or any industry to go out there and, you know, get, get the right information on how to go out there and get success. So I started the podcast because I'm like, dude, I just want to interview the doers, cats like yourself, dudes like yourself that are out there in the trenches. They're actually doing it every single day. So there's no smoke and mirrors, no theory, actual strategy. Um, so with that being said, man, those that are watching, listening right now are listening because they're here to get that strategy, right? To go out there and, and do what you've done. They want to go out there and create the life they know they want and deserve. So any last piece of words of, of motivation or advice or inspiration I'd like to leave our listeners with so they can go out there and create that same success? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it, this can be done, right? There's a million people out there that, that do this and survive it. And one thing that people were telling me before I left the railroad was, hey, look, man, the real estate has its ups and downs. You know, it has good seasons and bad seasons. Are you sure that's something you want to do? It's very inconsistent. And my response to them was, there are people that have been doing this thing for 30 years, right? And this is all they've ever done. They've made it through every downturn. Then they made it through the good times. It can be done, right? So why not me? And why not you, right? You can absolutely do this thing. Um, just get 100% clarity on what it is that you want. Have faith in yourself and be totally in and totally committed. Um, one thing that I did that I don't know if this is recommendable or not, but it's just the way I did it. Um, I, I slacked off at my job, right? And was that good? Not for them. I mean, they didn't appreciate that. I was in management and I, I changed my focus from the job to the people, right? So uh, stop really doing my job well because I was so busy with real estate, started really focusing on building up the people who I was supposed to lead. Um, and, but I knew that I was leaving, right? I knew that there was no way I was staying. The, the resignation was coming. So I switched my focus onto being a people person. And that's the skill I need in this, in this job, you know, is serving people and, um, and treating them right. You know, so I would recommend anybody to, if you're thinking about, Doing this full time, you know, 
consider that, you know, if, if you're for hundred percent sure that you're going to leave, go all in and invest in yourself emotionally and, and mentally and physically and in every single way, it's going to help you create success. Get on the audio books, get with a good coach and, uh, just, just go all in. Like, what's that analogy where the soldiers went to the foreign land on a ship to, uh, to have war and the generals burned the ships. Yep. Right. There's no retreat. So once you go all in, do it, it, it can be done. People are doing it every day and those people believe in themselves and they get the job done. So let's really just have faith in yourself. Yep. Love it. Powerful words, dude. Um, those watching and listen, I know we end every podcast with this, you guys, but information without implementation is really just a start of delusion. Information's not power. It's taking that information, applying it into your world, taking action that creates power in your life. Jeremy drops so many just amazing pieces of advice nuggets on you guys today take something that you learned go out there and apply it so you can create the life you know you want and deserve and jeremy man this has been an awesome time brother thanks appreciate brother. you being here i know how busy you are dude this has been a lot of fun no, i've been excited man thanks for the opportunity i appreciate it, josh yeah 100 all right you guys we will see you and talk to you next time